What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. It's the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. That's what I said. Those of you who are not Catholic, at least not at this time, and you've got questions about the Catholic faith, we can help you get those questions answered. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Now, if you're listening to us outside of North America, please dial the U.S. country code and then 205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And those of you watching us on uh, TV today, you can participate as well. Here's our email address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. All right, Charles Beery is our uh, producer. We also have Ryan Penny on the phones. Jeff Burson is on social media. He'll be glad to pass on any questions you might want to forward to us via YouTube or Facebook. Just put those in the comments section uh, there that you see on screen, and Jeff will uh, forward those to us here in the studio. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Andrews. Hey, Tom. How are you today? Very well. How are you, my friend? We're oh, doing great. Thanks. Glad to hear that. We're going to lead off here with an email from Richard who says, I'm not a Catholic, but I have been praying the rosary, and I need help with the Glory Be prayer. When it says, quote, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, what does it mean by world without end? Doesn't the world end and get replaced when Jesus comes back? Yeah, so this is an infelicitous translation of the Latin phrase in secula seculorum, which would be more idiomatically translated as forever and ever. Oh, okay. So it just, it's just kind of the, uh, an accident of, of the history of translation of uh, Latin prayer, and, um, and that's what we're talking about. Okay, very good. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for your email. Here's one now from Logan checking us out on YouTube. Logan says, Both of my parents respect the Catholic Church. They admire all of the liturgy and devotions, the papacy, even reverence for Mary. However, they do not feel inclined to convert. What can I do? Thanks, Logan. Okay, thanks. So, um, first of all, you can't compel someone to believe. Right. And in fact, the, the Catholic doctrine of faith is precisely that it is a gift. And there are motives uh, that make our faith rational. There, there are reasons that it's not irrational to believe. There are proofs and evidences for the truth of Catholic claims. But to be able to put all of those together... Uh, and then to actually make an act of submitting one's mind and will to the church and to Jesus Christ as he's present to us in the Catholic faith mm -hmm. transcends our rational capacities, our natural capacities, and ultimately is a gift of grace. So, so you can always answer questions. Uh, you can always remove obstacles. You can always witness to the truth and goodness and beauty of the faith in ways that are more than, but not less than, rational. I mean, showing the truth of the faith is one thing. Demonstrating the truth of the faith in your life is uh, of a wholly different and, and superior order, right? Ultimately, the life of charity and humility, discretion, and all the virtues mm -hmm. uh, as you lovingly interact with your, with your loved ones. I mean, all of these things are helpful. And, of course, praying always for yourself and for the souls of others and for the salvation of the whole world. Um, uh, masses said for your and others' intentions. I mean, all these things are helps and they're very good to do. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we leave the question of the conversion of hearts and the salvation of souls in the hand of God. And I would say unburden yourself a little bit of a responsibility that you don't actually own. There you go. Logan, thanks for checking us out on YouTube. Here's an email now from Nicholas. Nicholas says, uh, we've heard and seen a lot in the past about interreligious dialogue efforts. But in the Bible, Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have life within you. So what do you believe keeps those outside of the Catholic Church from coming to accept the truths of our faith? 
Okay, well, that's a very broad question. And there are all kinds of things that can keep people from coming to the truths of the Catholic faith. One of them that St. Paul identifies is how will they believe if they haven't heard? Yeah. And I, I think the biggest the biggest impediment or obstacle to accepting the teaching of the Catholic faith is not having heard it. And even someone who is disposed to believe in divine revelation can't make an act of faith in divine revelation if they don't encounter it. And I, I love the story of St. Josephine Bakita, uh, who, before she ever encountered the Catholic faith, never knew anything about God, Christ, the Bible, the history of the people of God, the sacraments, nothing. Had no, nothing, nothing whatsoever at all. But she had nature. And she had the witness of her own conscience. And from those two things, she, she surmised that there was a God in heaven and that to know and love and honor him was the, was the meaning of her life. But, uh, but she didn't have a name to put with that intuition. And uh-huh. then when she, so she was disposed, she was properly disposed, but she still had to wait the coming of the missionaries, had to wait the coming of that Italian diplomat who redeemed her from slavery and showed her the gospel to go, oh yeah, that's the guy I've been worshiping all this time. <laughs> I believe, right? You know, yeah. Someone has to present the truth of the faith. So that's an obstacle. Um, now, some of the claims of the faith make moral demands upon us. And that's a huge obstacle. So St. Augustine of Hippo, before he came to the Catholic faith, two things that kept him out. One, number one was he thought that you couldn't reconcile the book of Genesis with natural science. And number two was his own libido, because the Catholic faith told him to live continently, Mm -hmm. and celibately, a thing that he did not want to do. And what had to happen for him to come to the faith was, first of all, he had to meet St. Ambrose, who said, yeah, that's not the way we read the book of Genesis. And he taught him the truth about how the Catholic faith understands scripture. And then he had to encounter the the visage, the image of St. Anthony of the desert, uh, a, a monk, uh, one of the earliest monastics, uh, hermits of the, de- the Egyptian desert, who lived this life of incredible self-denial, chastity, and temperance, heroically, and with no education. And Augustine was shamed by that and said, well, if this guy can do it, yeah. you know, I should be able to do it too. And then, of course, ultimately, he felt the call of God and, uh, and encouraged by that catechesis and those examples together with the grace of God. He made that act of will and divine revelation. Isn't it amazing how uh, one person can make such a difference in your life? You're, you're going along and all of a sudden somebody clears things up for you and you go, oh, now I get it. I think that's one of the ways that grace and providence work. It's an awesome thing. Thank you so much uh, for your question. In a moment here, we're going to get to Dave in Columbus, Indiana, listening to us also on YouTube today. We've got a line open for you if you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833 833- 288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986 for Call to Communion. Do stay with us. It's Call to Communion here on EWTN. Our producer, uh, Charles, reminds us that lines do tend to fill up rather quickly, so you may want to call now if you have a question for Dr. David Anders, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. If you're ready now, let's go to those phones and talk with Dave. Dave is in Columbus, Indiana, listening on YouTube. Hey there, Dave, what's on your mind today? I've got a couple of questions on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and I first want to say thank you to Dr. Anders for all he does. My okay. first question is, how do we know that uh, Christ is fully present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in every particle of the host and in every precious drop of the blood, and then is that from Scripture or from tradition outside of Scripture or from reason? If he could tell me what that argument is. And then second, related, is why did Luther and the Protestants, why were they so keen on forcing communion under both species? Were they just trying to draw a distinction and say the Catholic Church was wrong, or was there some other political point or religious tenet that they were trying to overthrow? Okay. Okay, thanks. Appreciate these questions. So first of all, with respect to how do we arrive at the precise dogmatic understanding of the metaphysics of the Eucharist? Is it just the Bible? Is it the Bible and sacred tradition? How does that work? And the answer is yes, right? Because Christ is the one who tells us that his flesh is real food and his blood is real drink. This is my body. This is the chalice of, of the blue covenant. Uh, new, Blue covenant, new covenant <laughs> in my blood, and so forth. So Christ affirms the doctrine of the real presence, 
Um, but but unpacking how we understand that, how we inter- you know, how we interpret it, how we apply it, that, that that's sacred tradition aids in that. And and we look to all kinds of elements of sacred tradition, not only the explicit teaching of the apostles and their successors and the early saints, but even in even in the liturgical behavior of Catholics in antiquity, the way they treat the Blessed Sacrament as worthy of worship. I mean, all of these things are witnesses to the faith and practice of Christian antiquity. That those who heard the faith from the apostles spoke and behaved in certain ways towards the towards the Blessed Sacrament that are only consistent with a doctrine of the realist of real presences of Christ in the elements. But, you know, there's an obvious problem. There's an obvious It doesn't look like his flesh and blood. I mean, it's an obvious problem. I mean, how do you account for that? How, it, flesh and blood doesn't look like flesh and blood. It looks like bread and wine. Well, what do you do with that? Well, what, what are appearances? What, what is flesh? And, and so the theologians turn to the tools of philosophy to try to explicate those distinctions. And what they realized is we're making a claim about a substantial reality. This is not a mere symbol. We're, there's something real here, but it exists in an extraordinary mode, one that's not present to the senses. And so theologians relied on the philosophical language of substance and accidents to give specification, both to the church's belief in the, the profundity of the real presence, but to the evidence of sense. And, you know, that wonderful hymn by St. Thomas Aquinas, Adorote Devote, yes. when, when he says, you know, um, d- 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 tasting, touching, seeing are in the deceived. What says trusty hearing, that must be believed because truth himself speaks truly or there's nothing true. I, I believe on the testimony of Christ and the church, not on the evidence of my senses. Uh, and so that's how we know. That's how we know. And then, of course, the uh, magisterium has come by and come back and dogmatically defined that that mm-hmm. that uh, philosophical explication. Now, why what wh- why was were the reformers so adamant in rejecting the holy sacrifice of the mass and our mode of communion and all of these things, whether reception in two kinds or or whatnot? So it's a little bit different depending on which reformer you're talking about, because none of them have the same theology of the Eucharist. Luther's theology is different from Calvin's. Calvin's is different from Zwingli's. Um, In Luther's case, Luther, of course, retained belief in the real presence. He he didn't like the language of substance and accidents because he didn't like to import Aristotelian categories, philosophical categories into the Christian faith because Luther was an irrationalist about faith. I mean, he's avowedly an irrationalist. He Uh he would say in the disputation against scholastic theology that— you, you can't do philosophy and theology at the same time. You can't construct a dialectic or a logic of faith, this kind of language, and that, that human reason is just wholly inadequate and it's unreliable uh, and, and the faith must of necessity seem absurd to people, that kind of thing. So he, he, didn't, he didn't dispute the idea that Christ was really present, but he did take issue with trying to specify that in philosophical language. So he rejects transubstantiation, but not the real presence. But that's not the real heart of Luther's critique of, of the Eucharist. The real critique that Luther had of the Catholic Mass was the doctrine of Eucharistic sacrifice. And, of course, in Catholic worship, we believe that to offer the body and blood of Christ to God is the supreme act of worship and the heart of the church's liturgy and of the Christian life. And, of course, Luther believed that ran flat contrary to his whole notion of salvation, which is that we don't contribute in any way. There's no moral good deed. There's no sacrificial right. There's no act of worship that can cooperate or contribute to our reception of grace or our path to heaven, that it's received simply by faith alone and God's imputing to us the righteousness of Jesus. So he rejected anything in the Catholic faith that smacked of moral cooperation or merit Mm -hmm. on the part of the church. And of course, the church teaches that offering the holy sacrifice of the mass is supremely meritorious, so much so that it can be done on behalf of the dead, another thing that Luther didn't like. So that's the reason, was one of the reasons that Luther framed his rejection in that way. And uh, the, you know, the, why the reception in two kinds? Well, I, I think there was a deeply ideological rather than an explicitly theological motive here. Another one of the key elements of the Reformation was the rejection of the Catholic doctrine of the priesthood 
and the distinction of the Christian people into two orders, clergy and laity, uh, that were ontologically distinct. Mm. And, and that was, of all the things that Luther taught, the doctrine of the priesthood of believers, the idea that believers were equal, all believers were equal, and there were no sort of states of life in the church, was the one that had the most widespread common reception. I mean, it was, a, it was, he was kind of a great populist of the day. And a lot of the populist religious movements borrowed that first from Luther to justify, you know, running around and burning down statues and setting flags on fire and yeah. dancing in the streets and going crazy. You know, they were like, hey, we're priests too, ah, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> sure. And uh, there was a lot of that sort of iconoclasm and violence, and they loved that, that doctrine of the priesthood of all believers to justify it. And, and nothing signaled symbolically the distinction of priests and laity like their different modes of communing. In, in early modern Europe, that the lay people would receive only the sacred host and that only once a year, and the priests would commune in both kinds every time mass was celebrated. And that was a, a very visible and visceral representation of that distinction of orders. And so demanding that the lay people commune like priests was, uh, was a, you know, a kind of a rallying cry, a propagandistic way of promoting that doctrine of the priesthood of believers. No, that's not the way they always framed it. They said, well, hey, Christ said, you know, take, eat, drink, and so that's what we need to do. But there was a real ideological motive behind that. Wow. All right, uh, Dave, thank you so much uh, for your question. That opens up a line for you right now. In fact, we have two lines open at the moment, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion here on EWTN. Let's go to Betsy now in Johnstown, Ohio, listening on the Blowtorch St. Gabriel Radio. Hey there, Betsy, what's on your mind today? Thank you for taking my call. Here's what's on my mind. I am Protestant, and I'm in a good, large Bible study, and we have just uh, started to talk about Noah and the flood. And um, the people, I guess there's, there's two points to this. First of all, as you as Catholics, do you understand that? I know you understand it as true, but do you understand it as literal or, or like narrative or, or just finding the truth out of it? Because you teach that um, man is wounded, not altogether evil. And how could God, who is just, have destroyed all the people that were on the earth except Noah um, if they were just wounded and not totally evil? Okay, yeah, we have, we, have, we have two different questions here. One is, how do Catholics interpret Genesis chapter 6? Uh-huh. Uh, and, and how literally should we take the story? And the other one is... How could God in justice drown uh, a, a lot of innocent people unless they were intrinsically evil and, and, and thoroughly vitiated in their nature such that everything that they did was wrong? Okay. Now, um, so, so first of all, when, when Catholics teach that we're wounded in original sin, that means we're all sinners, I mean, the, 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 the dis, this distinction that you're drawing between dead in your sin and wounded in your sin doesn't, d- doesn't destroy the Catholic belief that we are all sinners in need of redemption. The fact that we're wounded means we sin. We sin. So when, when Protestants sometimes make a big deal out of this wounded versus dead business, what they have in mind is Luther and Calvin's doctrine of total depravity. Now, what total depravity means is this. This is what Catholics reject. The Calvinist doctrine of total depravity is that everything that you do, when you drink a glass of water, when you scratch your nose, when you, when you make your son's lunch and put it in his dinosaur lunchbox and send him off to first grade, every single action that you perform is intrinsically hateful to God and deserving eternal damnation. So that's the Protestant view. Now, there's a, there's a Puritan preacher, Protestant Puritan preacher, 17th century preacher, who once said, if we dropped from our mother's wombs into hell and were there roaring, it would be just. Because the very being and essence of the human person is hateful to God in its nature. Wow. That is what Catholics reject. The, 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 the nature of humanity as such is not intrinsically hateful to God. God said, in fact, it is good. 
Now, now to, for God to say that human nature is good does not mean that every individual human is owed the reward of heaven because we still sin. Mm -hmm. We are wounded and we sin and we need forgiveness and redemption. It just means that also what God said, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should be saved. What it, what, it didn't say God so hated the world that he sent his son. God loved the world, so he sent his son. Human nature is not intrinsically hateful to God as such. And when I, when I pack my son a PB&J and put it in his dinosaur lunchbox, that act is not in itself intrinsically hateful to God. It doesn't necessarily win me heaven. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't deserve an eternity of bliss because I made the PB&J, but it wasn't a bad thing. Now, strictly understood in Protestant doctrine of total depravity, Calvin would say, yeah, it's a bad thing because your action is vitiated by concupiscence, lust, pride, that there's, there's qualifying conditions that make everything that you do evil. That was Calvin's view. But the Catholic view is concupiscence, pride, well, pride's different, concupiscence, that immoderate attachment to bodily pleasure, uh -huh. is not evil. It may tend to evil, you may respond to it in evil. It may be provocative of evil. It may elicit evil because it's a wound. Mm -hmm. But you're not evil just because you're a human being. Okay. All right. Now, uh, more to the point, your question, uh, Genesis 6, would God be unjust if he brought about the death of the innocent? No. Because it does, happens every day. Every single day, millions of people around the world die. Is that's the you know we're not owed we're not owed eternity, we have a we have a determinate span of life, seventy years says the psalmist or eighty if we have the strength, mm -hmm. we're all going to die. It's not unjust that we have that we're mortal. It wasn't unjust when the people in Genesis chapter six were found to be mortal, you know they they weren't they weren't all Aquaman, <laughs> right? That's not they're not owed etern they're not owed immortality. So it's not mm -hmm. unjust. If, if God brings it about through his providence that someone should die a natural death. It's not, it's not injustice on God's part. Um, but uh, your question, how do Catholics understand this? Well, we, we really follow the teaching of the Bible about the interpretation of the Bible. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, tells us that the story of, story of Noah is an allegory for the sacrament of Christian baptism. Many other passages of the New Testament tell us that Old Testament passages are to be read allegorically. Galatians chapter 4, St. Paul says that the story of, of Hagar and Sarah is an allegory that describes children born of the flesh and those born of the spirit after the faith of Abraham, and that it should be read in that light. So Catholics, following the teaching of the New Testament and the example of the fathers, read these and other Old Testament stories allegorically. The real significance of Genesis 6 is not whether or not we're going to find wooden remains on the top of Mount Ararat, <laughs> which I contend we are not, um, but that this tells us something about the nature of human moral responsibility, God's justice, and also his redemptive plan and his kindness, because the conclusion of the story is that God makes a way for humanity to be saved. So we see ourselves in the story of Noah and the unjust who die and call to mind the grace of baptism, the ark of salvation that Christ provides for us. All right, Betsy, a great call. Thank you so much for checking in with us today here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Well, we have a couple of lines open, and we're going to uh, continue on the other side of the break. We will uh, uh, talk with Joe, who's right here in Birmingham, Alabama. Also, Michael in Silver Spring, Maryland. Michael is also checking in with us uh, from YouTube. We're also going to get to uh, several questions uh, via email and text. Hope to hear from you today on EWTN's Call to Communion at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. As uh, our producer says, get those calls in early because they do fill up. Lines do fill up. Call to Communion here on EWTN. Stay with us. Glad you're with us here on Call to Communion on EWTN. We have a line or two open right now at 833-288-EWTN. 
That's 833-288-3986. Let's go to Joe right now, right here in good old Birmingham, Alabama, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hey, Joe, what's on your mind today? Hey, uh, so the I know the Pope's entitled to his opinion, but the statement yesterday regarding homosexual civil unions seems to be tampering with doctrine. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, I know he's the Holy Father, but uh, it's just, and, and it's not like it's going to affect me in the Catholic faith in the sense of I'm going to go away from the Catholic Church. I, anything I'm going to fight for, it, just like I would anything else I believe in. But where where are we at at this point in, in a statement like that from the Holy Father? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. So, so first of all, let's get clear on the Church's doctrine on the papacy and the nature of the, of the Pope's magisterium and of the charism of papal infallibility and how all this plays out in, in, in the present circumstance. So what the Church teaches is that the papacy is an office established by Christ with a number of functions, and, and one of them is executive uh, and judicial and legislative leadership in the Church. And so... Uh, wholly apart from questions of infallibility, um, the church has got a job, I mean, the p- Pope's got a job to do, and it can be things like the appointment of, vis- of bishops and the promulgation of canon law and, uh-huh. and adjudicating disputes. And I mean, these are, these are functions of an office uh, that, uh, that need to be carried out in the maintenance of any sort of institution, uh, including and especially the church. And that's the Pope's job description. And another one of his major job descriptions is to is to guarantee the integrity of the faith, and to teach it and see that it's taught and handed down with faithfulness through generation to generation. In all of these things, he has a duty to perform, and popes can perform that duty well or badly, and they will answer to God for their actions. So Saint Paul, talking about his his own apostolic office, would say, for example. I don't really care if you guys in Corinth judge me, but God will judge me. I don't judge myself. The Lord will judge me and hold mm-hmm. me to account, you know, for the kind of kind of ministry that I've conducted. I have a charge to do. I've got to do this. I've got to do it well or badly. May I do it well, and God will hopefully reward me. Popes stand in the same circumstance. They can fulfill their duties well, or they can do them badly. And, and we, the faithful, are not obligated to always believe that every intervention— that a pope makes in the conduct of his office is somehow gracious or wise or prudent. Now, I'm not, I'm not issuing any opinion about the wisdom or prudence of this present situation. I just, we just need to get clear on the position. Okay. All right. When the pope teaches uh, a matter to be held uh, with certainty as something revealed by God, uh, by all the Christian faithful, and he declares that in a formal act— you know, all Christians have to believe in the dogma of the Trinity, for example, or, or the intrinsic immorality of homosexual acts, this kind of thing. Then he teaches infallibly, and what he says is guaranteed by the charism of infallibility. That's not at issue in this present circumstance. It's just not at issue. We're talking about a prudential judgment about the application of Catholic moral theology to a particular social problem, and to and to the crafting of modern legislation. That's what this is about. Mm-hmm. And and the Pope has been quoted. Now I have I don't read Italian and I haven't seen the thing in context and I haven't watched this documentary and all of that, right? But the way it's being presented in the media is that the Pope has has made some interventions um, or made some comments about the way public policy ought to be crafted. Um, that I've read the statements and nothing on the face of them directly contradicts the Catholic teaching on the indissolubility and primacy of Christian marriage on chastity or the, or the intrinsic immorality of homosexual acts. And, uh, and I think Catholics have a duty to, um, to regard this, uh, like all kinds of policy initiatives, um, in light of the Church's longstanding tradition and what we know about moral theology and, and, uh, and what we know about the nature of the papacy. All right. Hey, Joe, thank you so much uh, for your call. We do appreciate it. Call to communion here on EWTN, our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Ryan just uh, sent us something here on YouTube. Ryan says, when and why did the Catholic Church start officially canonizing saints 
And how does the church determine who becomes a saint? Yeah, thanks. So, so the, the church has always uh, informally recognized some people as worthy of veneration um, and, and belief that their prayers would be particularly efficacious because they could be known to be in heaven. That, that's always been a part of the Catholic faith from the very beginning. Okay. Um, and and sort of, if you will, the first official act of canonization was done by Jesus himself uh, in an anticipatory fashion. He said to St. Desmus on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So, uh, and of course, the book of Revelation depicts the martyrs in particular as, uh, as and martyrs and then the elders there together with Christ in heaven, crying out onto the altar or offering the prayers of the saints on earth to God is so much incense. So this is a sort of New Testament biblical idea that some souls are in heaven interceding for us and, uh, and, uh, and some can be known with reasonable certainty from the sanctity of their life or, or their manner of death if they followed Christ unto martyrdom. And so early second century, um, the church began to collect the bones, the relics of the martyrs and to venerate them uh, in shrines to their honor. In fact, the, the churches were later built, first physical structures called churches were built on the shrines of the martyrs. So the cult of martyrs went first, and then the church buildings followed. And so you can actually track the progress of Christianity in the ancient world, but archaeologically by tracing the progress of the relic cult. I mean, that's how the thing plays out. Okay. And uh, of course, you know, when persecution slowed down and martyrdoms became less frequent, people were venerated for their heroic chastity and their continence uh, and their self-denial. Many of the desert fathers were venerated as holy people after their death. And, uh, and you know, it, look, it's a little bit easier to live in as, as an ascetic than to die a horrible death by martyrdom. And so you get a little saint multiplication going on. Yeah. And by the, by the high Middle Ages, we, um, you know, we had, uh, we had kind of an inflationary problem. And uh, you had people, you had people kind of getting declared, popularly declared as saints, sort of willy-nilly, if you uh -huh. will. Mm -hmm. And so in the 10th century, the Holy See says... Um, we think we think we better take this over, <laughs> and so then by the 11th century you get some formal processes for okay we need some standards and some criteria here to mm. to recognize who really is you know a, a heroic in charity and witness of their life and then miracle you know post mortem miracles and so forth and sort of the modern regime of canonization flows out of that and every once in a while the popes will will tweak the criteria a little bit to make them more sane more just you know whatever. 1983 code of canon law made some special interventions. Pope Benedict made some interventions to, to how do you incorporate those who were venerated as saints before that regime, and, and you know mm. when is it still okay to recognize somebody's sanctity? But the basic rule and process is a local bishop would have someone in his diocese who was really worthy of uh, of um, of great deal of respect, and so he'll appeal to the Holy See to open a cause, that's what it's called, uh -huh. to investigate this person's life, and then he's a servant of God, that's a technical term, and then after investigation, if he's found to have, he or she is found to have lived a life of heroic charity and virtue, then he's venerable, um, you know, then if, uh, you know, miracles start happening in response to his intercession, he's beatified, at that point he's considered, it's, it's, it's worthy of belief in this person's sanctity, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the actual decree of canonization which is at one of the secondary objects of infallibility guaranteed, we know with certainty this soul is in heaven and, and should be venerated in public cult and their prayers and intercessions are efficacious for the church at large. All right, uh, Ryan, thanks so much for checking us out today on YouTube. It's called a communion here on EWTN. And let's go now to uh, Michael. Michael's listening in Silver Spring, Maryland on YouTube. Hey, Michael, what's on your mind today? Hi there. Uh, hey, thanks for taking my call, Dr. Anders. Um, I've always been kind of stumped by this. Um, the Catechism of the Church, 416, says that Adam is the first man. He, he lost the original holiness he received from God, not only for himself, but for other human beings. So here's my question. Here we are generations later. And um, I, I guess my question, first question is, why does God allow this? Why does this, or why is this transpiring? It's a long time to be in the gulags, if you will. And, and I guess, you know, I'm thinking of Augustine when he says, our hearts are restless until it rests in thee. The good Lord knows that we long for him. We want to be with him. Why wouldn't a loving God just say, you know what? Y'all have been 
out there for a long time. We're going to connect you now. We're going to we're going to become one. Why doesn't that happen, Dr. Anders? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. So first of all, when the church teaches that the gift of sanctifying grace was lost in Adam to all his progeny, what that means is simply that we are not born with sanctifying grace inhering in our souls. Only the Blessed Virgin Mary had that dignity. Um, it doesn't mean that sanctifying grace is not offered to us. It's just not we're born. We're not born with it as our patrimony, if you will. Uh-huh. And uh, and we also come into the world wounded, uh, you know, not not hateful to God, but wounded in ways that make it difficult to attain to the life of sanctity. And um, uh, and look, you don't have to look around too far to see the evidence of that, right? I mean, I, like, I don't, I just have to introspect for five seconds, and I realize that, yeah, I'm wounded. It's it's hard for me to live a life of, 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 of charity and virtue and holiness, and I'm distracted by many things. My heart is, you know, torn in more than one place, sometimes the things above, sometimes the things below. below. It's just kind of the common lot of the human race. Uh, the, the dogmatic formulation of that is just giving precise definition to what we all experience, that there's a law in my mind, there's another law at work in my members. Woe is me, who will rescue me from this body of death? That's what St. Paul says in Romans chapter 7. But balance that reality against the teaching of the church. Uh, the uh, Second Vatican Council and the Pastoral Constitution on Church in the Modern World, Gaudi et Spes, said this, All this holds true, not only for Christians, but for all men of goodwill, in whose hearts grace works in an unseen way. All men of goodwill, in whose hearts grace works in an unseen way. For since Christ died for all men, and since the ultimate vocation of man is in fact one and divine, we ought to believe that the Holy Spirit, in a manner known only to God, offers to every man the possibility of being associated with this paschal mystery that the offer of grace and participation in Christ and the life of eternity and blessedness is offered to everyone, everyone, whether they've explicitly encountered the gospel or not, it's going to be offered to them in a way known only to God. Now, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 teaches that, that God's plan was to restore all things in Christ. And the Greek word there that's translated restore can also be rendered as recapitulated, Hmm. And St. Irenaeus of Lyon, the church's earliest systematic theologian, interpreted it this way. He said, look, we all fell in Adam, yes? All right, that's a great tragedy. But here's the, here's the beautiful thing, also drawn from St. Paul. Christ is the second Adam. And even as we all fall in Adam, Christ renews, recapitulates the story of humanity, recreates it in his own likeness and image, uh, joins his divinity to our humanity and recapitulates it um, making making a new way of holiness and, and divinization available to everyone, right? In the profoundest kind of union, like the union of divinity and humanity in the person of Christ. And in a sense, that pervades the entire human race. And, and this, this deep, profound possibility of divinization or theosis or profound participation in God it's not just an intellectual possibility. It's been made sort of ontologically available to us by the recreation of the human race after the likeness and image of Christ in the incarnation. That's the way St. Irenaeus saw that. And so in a sense, we're all just called to, 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 to realize that possibility that's, that's, that's imminent. It's imminent to us in, our, in humanity's union with the divinity in the incarnation. And, uh, and so we can combine that with the teaching of the Second Vatican Council on the offer of grace made to every human being, the profound union of the divine and human in Christ himself, and the, this tremendous transcendent call to a life of utter beatitude and the beatific vision. And in light of those realities, all of our sufferings and struggles, St. Teresa of Avila would say, are like one night in a bad hotel, <laughs> you know? And, 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 you know, God loves a good story, now, that's another way of putting it. I mean, mm. the, the, the struggles and the trials and the difficulties that we go through now are given to us as, as opportunities of grace and merit and, and, and the, you know, the proof of our charity and, and to deepen our experience of God and our connection to Christ and in the crucifixion and his own resurrection. And we have a participation in Christ that is not offered even to angels, not offered even to angels, that our, that our experience of Christ in eternity will be something so much more sublime and profound even than that of the holy angels. They will not have been given the dignity of this profound union 
in the person of Christ, of the divine and human in which we share. Michael, thank you so much uh, for your call. We do appreciate that. Call to communion here on EWTN. I want to take just a moment to tell you about something I look forward to, to hit my email inbox every Thursday morning, and that is WINGS. It is our EWTN weekly e-newsletter. It's absolutely free once you sign up for it. You can find out about what's going on with EWTN radio, EWTN television, what's going on uh, on the register, items from religious catalog, so much more. You can sign up for Wings, again, absolutely free. Just go to EWTN.com and look for the subscribe button. EWTN.com and then click on subscribe button. You'll find all sorts of things you can subscribe to. One of those is Wings. We've been doing it for a long long time and look forward to sending that to you every week. Call to communion here on EWTN. We have a, a question from Alex watching us on YouTube right now. Alex says, Matthew 6, 7 talks about prayers of repetition. Well, the rosary is a prayer of repetition. How do you defend this prayer? Yeah, so actually that's not what Matthew 6, 7 says. Uh -oh. Matthew, say, Matthew says, do not pray like the pagans. Do not pray like the pagans who think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't do that. Don't do that. So, you know, I, I haven't always been Catholic. I used to be a Protestant. When I was a Protestant, we had deeply repetitive prayers. My father prayed the same thing every single day before <laughs> dinner. It got to be like a drone pounding in my head, you know. <laughs> uh, same prayer every day, right? Um, but he didn't fall into the superstition of thinking that he was going to be heard because he'd prayed it 365 times in a year, right? Um, Catholics, any Catholic who thinks that God will hear them in virtue of the fact that they have prayed many prayers would be guilty of the sin of superstition. And that is not how Catholics are taught to understand the prayers of the Rosary or of Sacred Scripture. Now, in terms of should we pray repetitively— well, our Lord commands it. He commands it. The apostle said, how should we pray? He said, pray like this. And then he gave them a formula. You think he wants us to pray the Lord's Prayer once? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I mean, the, the traditional understanding is when he says, give us this day our daily bread, we're, we understand that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that the Christian faithful ought to pray at least daily. Sure. That's pretty repetitive. That's pretty darn repetitive. Christ commands it. Um, Jesus himself was fond of praying the Psalms. He quotes them all the time. And so does the rest of the New Testament. The apostles, we know, continued the Jewish practice of praying the Psalter. Try looking at Psalm 136. His love endures forever. His love mm. endures forever. His love endures forever. I mean, it's like a bad love song. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's actually quite a beautiful love song, you know, but it's repetitive like one. Sure. And uh, it's extremely repetitive. Scripture is replete with repetitive prayers. Scripture doesn't condemn repetition in prayer. It condemns the pagan superstitious belief that we will be heard because of our many words. Now, you know, in, in pagan antiquity, they didn't know which one was the right God. They had all kinds of gods. They had mm -hmm. gods coming out of every pocket. Yeah. St. Paul encountered an altar in Athens to an unknown God. He said, we'll just cover one. If we, we missed one, we'll throw one out there. Yeah, one we didn't cover. You know? And they thought, well, if we offer sacrifices to all these, maybe one will hear. That's really the attitude that, that's being dismissed, mm -hmm. right? This kind of, let's just throw it all out there and see what sticks. But if you understand prayer, right? St. Augustine, in great reflection on the nature of prayer, says, why even use words? God already knows what you need before you ask. Yeah. We don't use words to tell God what we want. We, we use words, particularly the words of the Lord's Prayer, to mark our own progress in bringing our will into alignment with the will of God. So when I pray the Lord's Prayer and I say, you know, hallowed be thy name, I stop and think, hmm, am I hallowing God's name? Thy kingdom come. Hmm, what am I doing to bring God's kingdom? How am I living? Hmm. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Hmm, how am I doing on forgiving those who trespass against us? We use words in prayer to mark the progress of our own dispositions mm -hmm. and desires and the faith, hope, and charity in our heart that will ultimately unite us to God. Should you do that more than once... I think so. Definitely. Hey, uh, thank you so much for your question, Alex. Let's go back to the phones right now and talk with Mike in Detroit, listening on the great Ave Maria radio, first-time caller. Mike, what's on your mind today? Hi, thank you for your team's work. Uh, when I was uh, 
calling to get information on whether the blessed mother died before her assumption. Maybe. Thanks. Maybe. Maybe. We don't know. We don't know. There are divergent traditions on this. So in in the West, when you when, iconographically, when they celebrate the assumption of the Blessed Virgin, she's often depicted as conscious and awake and, you know, glorified and pretty happy looking. Uh-huh. In the East, there's a different tradition. They, they speak of the Dormition of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and their iconography presents her as dying before her assumption. And the Church hasn't defined the question and likely never will. So there are pious traditions that are allowable that hold either uh, opinion, and uh, and really, you know, there's there's just no dogmatic answer to the question. Okay, Mike, thank you so much uh, for your call. And uh, one point of clarification, David, when you say dormition, does that mean sort of a falling asleep? Does that mean dying? Well, she died. I mean, she in the in the Eastern tradition, she okay. died, and then okay. she's assumed. Very good. Here's a question now, and this is a this is kind of a tough one here. Here we go. Uh, Daniel, watching us on YouTube. My father suffered with mental illness for many years before he finally committed suicide. I want to pray for my father's salvation. I'm just not sure it would be proper in the Catholic Church. And by the way, I'm not Catholic, but I feel like I'm being drawn to the Church. David, any thoughts there? Yeah, thanks. First of all, I'm so sorry. What a horrible, horrible suffering you have endured. Yeah. My heart goes out to you. That must be so frustrating. Mm. One of the great blessings of being a Catholic is the knowledge that we are not cut off from our loved ones by death, and not just in the knowledge that we may see them again, but in the knowledge that we can actually be actively involved with them right now in the world through our prayers and intercessions and their prayers and intercessions for us. I lost my own father this year. It was very difficult for me. He was my best friend. We were very, very close. And uh, I frequently make trips to the cemetery, and I pray for the repose of his soul and ask him to pray for me. And that connectedness that I have to my dad is a great comfort. I'm so grateful to the Catholic faith for teaching me that I can have an ongoing relationship of love with my father, and no one is dead to God. All people are alive in him. So that's a great blessing. And I think that that is also there for you, right? That is there for you. Um, while suicide is intrinsically evil, uh, we, we let God be the judge of the extent of a person's rationality or free will, anything that they do. Ultimately, God only sees the heart. We can judge the action to be wrong. Uh-huh. But that doesn't mean that the person who committed the action was in their right mind. And for us to be really fully culpable for a moral evil, we have to be in our right mind, know what we're doing, and not be acting under compulsion. And uh, Church recognizes this in the case of suicide, never never advocates suicide, understands suicide is an evil, you know, euthanasia is totally wrong, but, uh, but doesn't cease to pray for those who may have died in this way, because ultimately it's God who understands what what was going on in that person's mind and heart? So, sure. Yeah. So I would say, go ahead, pray, pray, pray all you want, pray all the time, and and take comfort and have great hope in God's mercy. Any thoughts about uh, Daniel feeling feeling drawn to the Catholic faith? Well, uh, you know, I'm with him. I'm drawn. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. You know, Water's fine. I, yeah. I mean, I was drawn to the Catholic faith. I'm I'm drawn every day. I mean. This is, uh, it's a great place to be. You know, the Catholic, I just gave one of the motives. There's so many motives, right? The Catholic faith humanizes us. Uh, It encourages us, gives us hope. I mean, we spoke earlier on the show about how it offers a realistic diagnosis of the human condition. We are wounded. We do have problems. We are at war in our own hearts. We're conflicted in our interior lives. Catholic faith recognizes that and offers us a way out. You know, G.K. Chesterton, when he was asked, why did you become a Catholic? He said, well, to get rid of my sins, of course. It's the only religion that really offers you a path to get rid of your sins. Not just forgiveness, but purgation. Like, how, do you, how can you actually overcome this body of death, grow in the kind of equanimity, peace, and wisdom, and charity that lead to flourishing and happiness in this life and the next? Where else are you going to go? Who are you going to call? you got to call the Catholic Church. Absolutely. We're going to close out here with a quick question from Mike, who wants to know, is grave sin the same as mortal sin? Um, okay, no, and yes. So, so an act can be objectively gravely wrong. The act can be objectively gravely wrong uh-huh. without the person being individually culpable mortally for that sin. So gravity is one of the conditions for a mortal sin. In order to have a mortal sin, 
The act has to be gravely wrong. The person has to be acting with understanding that what they do is wrong and not under compulsion. So it's a condition of mortal sin, but it's not, su it's not sufficient for there to be mortal sin. Glad we could sneak that one in. Dr. David Andrews, thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. Don't forget, we do the program Monday through Friday on EWTN Radio. 2 p.m. Eastern is our live show, and then we repeat that show at 11 p.m. Eastern time on the radio network. Uh, we also have the best of Call to Communion. Our producer, Charles, picks out what he thinks is the best show of the week. Sometimes it's a tough choice, but somehow he does it. And so that's what we play for you every Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern on radio as well. And don't forget, you can always check out the podcast anytime at EWTNradio.net. On behalf of our fantastic team, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Andrews. See you next time here on Call to Communion. God bless.